Welcome to episode three of APS Stamp Chat. I'm Scott English, Executive Director of the American Philatelic Society. Joining me is Dr. Greg Redner, who just recently became president of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada. Greg's topic for this talk is auxiliary markings, a primer. Greg is on the board of directors of the Auxiliary Markings Club and Sports Philatelist International. Greg has exhibited at the national and international level in a single frame exhibit on Belgium's 3 centine 1915 King Albert the first issue has been awarded the single frame grand award at a world series of philately show a lifelong collector greg began collecting worldwide stamps at the age of eight he became interested in, in the stamps of canada in his teens focusing on newfoundland for the past 20 years greg has concentrated on the stamp issues of belgium with a focus on the 1919 to 1921 issue greg has published articles in numerous philatelic journals including the canadian philatelist the philatelic exhibitor Auxiliary Markings, Topical Times, and the American Philatelist. He is also an international presenter on Belgian philately and, in the past, has made presentations in Canada, the U.S., England, Belgium, and France for organizations such as the RPSC, American Topical Association, and the American Philatelic Society, including previous stamp chats. For those watching the presentation live, your microphone and camera are disabled during the presentation. To engage fellow attendees, please make comments in the chat section. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box, and we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. If you're watching a recording of this presentation, please feel free to ask questions in the comment section. This program is provided thanks to APS member support. If you are not already a member of the APS or would like more information about our services, please visit our website at stamps.org. Greg, first of all, congratulations on being elected president of the RPSC, and welcome back to Stamp Chat. Thanks, Scott. And, uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, being here this evening. Um, I'll begin by uh, sharing my screen here. So just give me a moment. Um, somebody um, once described one of them, I have another passion, which is I love pre philatelic uh, Belgian mail. And someone once described my uh, love of this and talking about this. Um, they said it's like when you want to show pictures of your newborn baby to people in your family and they go, oh, well, that's great. They love to see it. But when you start talking about cancellations and auxiliary markings on pre-philatelic mail, it's like when you want to show pictures of someone else's baby to people in your family. Uh, this, is, this is kind of an out there topic for a lot of people. Um, and so what I would like to do tonight is I would like to uh, share with you um, the different types of auxiliary markings there are in case you haven't actually thought about this um, and to talk about um, what an auxiliary marking is and what it's not. What do auxiliary markings tell us? And then for me, the most fascinating part of the uh, auxiliary marking story is what the auxiliary markings tell us in terms of being a story. Um, and we're going to do this with a, I guarantee you, a corner of philately that you've never gone down before. And if you have, please get in touch because that would make you and me the only two people in North America that actually collect this. So, and then last of all, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on typology, um, but just some ideas on how to organize and, and collect. So let's get started. Okay, so what do auxiliary markings do? Um, an auxiliary marking helps to move the mail. Um, that's its primary job. They're designed to hold something when uh, there's an issue, like it's underpaid, the mail is underpaid, or maybe um, the address is not clear. Um, they're designed to redirect, say, when you've moved and you have a uh, a forward order or you, uh, the post office knows that you've moved to a different direct, uh, address. Um, they're designed to return mail to you when your um, address is not correct or there's some deficiency in it. Um, and they also indicate why a piece of mail hasn't arrived at the post office or at your home, the delivery spot in a, a usual timely fashion. So what do they tell us? I mean, here's a very simple card. Um, this one, um, a U.S. Um, post office, um, kind of early 20th century. Take a look at it. It tells you this card was held for postage. In other words, there's not enough um, 
there's not enough postage on this card to get it delivered to the person um, that it was supposed to go to. There's a secondary auxiliary marking on this, um, which tells you the date that it arrived at the post office. Um, in this case, it could also be the date that it was released to the person who had paid the extra postage. That's very simple. We all get that. Here's a redirected label. Um, these are not quite as common, uh, at least in the U.S. where and Canada, where hand stamps are king. Um, but this just simply tells you we're sending this to someone else. Uh, this is a piece of military mail. We're sending this to someone else uh, to a different address because we're aware that this person has moved or in some sad cases, the, the recipient is deceased and it's being sent to an alternative uh, marking. Those are, those are pretty simple. Of course, there's the famous return to sender pointing finger. Uh, the return to sender uh, is one of the reasons that a lot of people in North America collect auxiliary markings. You can't even begin to imagine the variety uh, that exists in these return to sender markings. Um, I'm going to talk about a book a little bit later on. Uh, um, by uh, the brilliant Tony Warkavich, um, where there are just manifold um, pages of the various types of these. Uh, the wording is different. Um, sometimes, I mean, this one is actually quite interesting. Um, if you look at it, it appears that there are only four fingers on that, uh, which is actually kind of an unusual thing. Uh, sometimes the cuff will have a button on it. Sometimes it won't. Um, just all of the variations in this. Um, and so a lot of people like to collect those because there's always something new. I don't know if we'll ever get to the bottom of it. Believe it or not, and this is a personal um, opinion uh, because some people disagree with you. I also believe that marks, manuscript marks that cross out an address or redirect to a new address, handwritten information also count as auxiliary marks. Um, and of course, this is a really remarkable um, cover that was originally supposed to go to Yokohama, it went through Kuching, um, just a really remarkable cover. But I'm fascinated by manuscript auxiliary marks as well. And for me, this would count as one, although some people would argue that that's not the case. Um, here is a delayed marking. Um, what do we learn from this? Um, that the airmail was interrupted. The flight that this was on was interrupted near Salt Lake City. Um, we don't really know why. Uh, but again, then the story becomes, once it was interrupted, what happened with it? Was it put on a train? Was it sent, you know, uh, by truck in some cases? Uh, so we get that information from it. Very interesting. Okay, um, this comes from the Auxiliary Marking Club website, and we'll talk a little bit more about the Auxiliary Marking Club later on, but this is a really good definition, um, and it's very thorough, so read along. An auxiliary marking is a postal marking applied to covers by hand stamp, machine cancellation, stick on label, manuscript marking or by mechanical or electronical electronic methods such as a dressograph or computer indicating that covers were given special attention due to some special circumstance a broad definition would include accompanying postal service letters and ambulance covers we'll talk about that if you don't know that um, term in a little bit in which damaged or misdirected mail has at times been delivered and markings placed on covers by institutions other than the Postal Service, such as military, prisons, hotels, etc. Auxiliary markings are sometimes known as instructional markings or supplementary markings. So if you read that, you think to yourself, okay, well, I can, I can find covers that do that, and then I'll know everything I need to know about auxiliary markings. But actually, what, in, what is not an auxiliary marking is really up to you. Um, I have yet to run into the auxiliary marking police um, in my philatelic journey. And there are some things that I think are auxiliary markings that other people don't agree with. Um, but it's my collection, and I can do whatever I want with it. 
So here are the different types, general different types of auxiliary markings. Um, there's the address graph. Now, we don't often think of the address portion of the of a letter or a piece of mail as being an auxiliary marking. Um, but because these are produced with address graph panels um, and they're a unique marking uh, that existed kind of in the 30s, 40s, and probably I would think into the 50s and 60s, um, many people collect address graph labels, uh, mailing labels as uh, auxiliary markings. And believe it or not, you can find many, many different types, different fonts, different sizes. Um, this one's interesting because it's got a double period at the end of uh, the second line. Hang on, I want to make sure I didn't skip one. I did. Okay. Now, a lot of people don't believe that cancellations count as auxiliary markings. But if you keep in mind that a cancellation is designed to direct the mail um, and inform the post office and inform the person um, who's received the letter where it's come from, um, and uh, in that regard, they do count as auxiliary markings. Um, I find um, that pre-philatelic mail um, before the, the days of stamps, in my case, I collect Belgium. So before 1849, um, the cancellations are really fascinating. Um, and uh, I, I never tire of the many different kinds of the information that's on them. Um, so if you agree with it, fine. If you don't, the cancellations don't have to count. Then, of course, there's the wartime sensor marking. And these come um, in a number of different uh, manifestations. Um, not only is there a sensor's uh, hand stamp on this, um, but there also is sensor tape. And labels and tape also count as auxiliary markings. Um, so this is a really interesting um, uh, one. Um, I love the marking in the upper left-hand corner that tells us that the letter is in Tamil, the language Tamil, and um, it's been approved by the censor and has been forwarded uh, to uh, Singapore. Then there are crash covers, and of course, some of these can end up being very, very expensive depending on um, which um, airplane or train crash uh, we're speaking about. But this is an example of one that isn't terribly expensive. And it tells us that this mail was salvaged from an airplane crash in Singapore in 1954. Um, again, you know, the post office wants you to know why your mail was delayed. Um, um, if assuming that there's uh, no one here that doesn't remember the day when um, we got lots of mail at home, um, uh, of course, that's not so much the case now, um, but the post office was keen to make sure that if your letter was delayed, that you understood why. Um, and here's a perfect example of that, a crash cover. Then there are damaged um, markings on, on mail. This one damaged by fire on the SS Comorin, um, a ship um, issue, it's lost its stamp. Um, but again, it's given us the, it's allowed us to understand why it's been delayed. Um, this one I really love. This is just the classic delayed marking. Um, this is a delayed uh, label. Um, very often they're hand stamps or sometimes you get delayed in, in processing. But this one I, I really love. The postmaster regrets that this letter has been inadvertently delayed in the post and wishes to express regret for any inconvenience occasioned. Um, that's, a, that's a locally produced one. Again, all of these things are, um, a lot of these are produced in-house. Um, and you can find some really unusual markings for delayed mail, especially. Um, one one um, thing um, that uh, people don't often think about, this is a disinfected mail marking. Um, especially in the 19th century, um, if mail was coming from a place uh, where there was cholera or um, 
disease of some type, very often the, the letters would be fumigated. Sometimes it involved making a slit in them and pumping in um, smoke or something like that to kill whatever was inside. I don't think it was particularly um, effective, um, but this is, uh, you know, this is a, a kind of turn of the century one. Um, it's coming from Marseille to uh, Sicily. However, um, in the late 19, in the late 1900s, at the turn of the 21st century, this was also the case um, in a lot of mail that was going into the U.S. Capitol um, because there was a tremendous concern over um, infected. Um, spores of things, and, um, and we're going to get to um, sanitization, but you often will find these as well going into government buildings at times of pandemic. I'm sure that we will uh, eventually find that there will be some of these um, from, um, from COVID, um, probably not here so much, but in some other places. Of course, there are hand stamps. Um, I'm actually fascinated with these PP markings. Um, this is a Belgian pre-philatelic marking. Um, the PP tells you that the, the port was paid, port payee, um, the postage was paid. And that's also confirmed by the manuscript marking, um, that slash across the, from corner, upper left to lower right corner um, is also an auxiliary marking because when you pay for a letter, um, it depends how far you paid it um, as to whether there's any postage due. And as you'll see later on, if the marking appears on the front cover, it means that the recipient has to pay that amount. If it's on the back cover, it's to instruct the, um, the incoming where the mail is going to be sent out from the incoming post office that this is the amount was paid that was paid justify it and make sure that we've covered the postage otherwise you can charge what you need to charge to justify that but this marking shows that the person that um, that canceled this in fact was saying that the postage was paid um, to the destination there are military markings associated with deliverability. Um, here's one on the side um, telling us that the delivery can't be made to the addressed. Um, of course, there are um, also markings that tell us about missing an action or killed in action, um, or that a particular um, division or battalion is on assignment and the mail can't reach them. Uh, so. Many people find those really fascinating to collect. There are also meter markings. Now, we don't often think of meter markings as a form of um, auxiliary marking, um, but in fact they are because not only do they contain um, a cancel uh, uh, in the center here, um, but they also tell you where the post office was, um, which country it's coming from, um, what are the postages paid, what the postage was, and it gives you also uh, the designation R21 um, would be um, the Gaborone, I think that's how you say it, the Gaborone Post Office in Botswana. That's the permit for the standard chartered bank R21. Um, there's a fascinating, um, there's a fascinating website um, which deals with Botswana postal marks um, and a Canadian website. Um, it's postalmarkings.ca, sorry, postal, postalhistory.ca. If you want to see how far this can be carried, have a look at that man's typology. Um, but this is a small country with a manageable number of, um, of meter marks. And uh, so it makes a really fun collecting area. Here's the pointing finger we've already talked about. You can see this one manages to have uh, five fingers. Um, and interestingly, it's got a um, writer unclaimed, it gives the Chicago post office as the uh, returner. But also, if you take a look, this one and down closer to the bottom has something different that the other one didn't. Not only does it have a cuff with a button on it, but it also has a suit coat 
jacket that that hand is coming out of. So already that's different than the one that we uh, that we looked at earlier. Um, this is a postage due mark. Again, this is a Belgian or uh, very often will appear in Western Europe. Uh, the T indicates that um, the postage wasn't properly paid and uh, that there is postage due. Um, pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, I, I'm particularly fascinated with this one. Um, this is a returned letter. Um, and this one is not only a returned letter, but it also um, uh, is a direction that if it can't be returned correctly, that it should go to the dead letter office. Um, and I've never seen this one before. Um, someone sent this to me. It's quite a, it's quite a fascinating uh, piece. Um, and it, of course, is designed to cover up the original information um, on, the, uh, on the envelope so it's not confusing. Here's a security uh, hand stamp uh, on a uh, auxiliary marking. Um, this one is designed to tell you that this, which is going to the BBC World Service House, was checked to make sure that it was safe and there was nothing inside um, during the days of the anthrax or the days of um, small bombs inside uh, mail. Uh, this one was checked and there was nothing in it to be worried about. There are spray-on markings. Um, I bet you've never ever thought about those ridiculous multi-lined um, computer uh, generated printed sprayed on markings as being something that you could collect. But in fact, um, they're endless in their variety and fascination. And of course, because they're recent, um, you're not this is not going to cost you a lot of money. Um, and you can collect a particular area, you can collect a particular town, um, and uh, there's uh, these change, uh, these sprayed on uh, markings change about every two months in Canada. I don't know how it is in the States. So it's a really uh, very interesting and complex area to collect. Of course, we're all familiar with the yellow forwarding labels, uh, but I have a good friend who has an excellent um, exhibit on forwarding labels, um, and so you can collect those as well. Modern version of the pointing finger, not nearly as, um, as lovely and as artistic, I think. The bottom line is whatever you enjoy collecting, um, whatever moves the your engagement with your area of collecting can be en enriched by collecting auxiliary marks. Um, this looks kind of like kind of an innocuous little boring envelope, but in fact, I'm fascinated by that little blue um, auxiliary label at the bottom. Um, I, one of the things that I collect is absent labels on Belgian mail, and it's a really interesting topic. Um, this was their solution at the bottom to the kind of political unrest that exi existed in Belgium over its kind of division um, in the early 1970s. Um, half the country is French speaking, half the country, the northern part is Flemish speaking. And one of the big issues on these absent labels was which, which language had precedence. The one on the left was considered more important. And I think the Belgian Postal Authority came up with a really good way to get around this. Uh, they simply inverted one side and now you can make whichever side you choose uh, to be the, uh, the prevalent one. So this is something that probably you would have very little interest in, but to me it's fascinating. Uh, and I'm always finding a different um, kind of incarnation of that label. Um, Scott, do you have questions? Is there anything before we go further? Uh, Greg, there was one question here that I think is a little more timely. So I'd like okay. to to pose it from one of the one of the viewers. Uh, you had a postage due uh, image that you showed, and the question was, was the postage due attributed to the stamp being cut in half, or was there another reason for why the postage due charge was there? Let's go back to it. 
So um, my assumption is that this letter was sent without postage. Um, and I, this is not, that's a postage due um, label at the, at the bottom. Um, and my sense is that this was sent without postage. Um, remember that post, well, I don't know, um, it wasn't until the late 1860s that postage became, that putting a stamp on an envelope in Belgium became um, required. Um, so my sense is that this is a piece of imprimé mail or or printed matter mail that was sent without postage. Um, and so um, the imprimé rate was five, would have been two and a, would have been two centimes um, at around this time. And so the penalty for sending a piece of mail unposted um, was double the normal amount. So uh, rather than a rather than a four cent charge, I think this one got a five cent charge. Um, that's my best. That's my best guess on it. Um, but nowhere I, I have this piece, and nowhere is there a indication that there ever was a, a a piece of postage on it, a stamp or anything like that. So I think that's what it's about. Uh, I have a comment here that uh, brings a little controversy into this discussion. I never thought I'd sure. say that, but uh, here we are. Uh, and one of the viewers is stating that he disagrees that a cancellation or meter is an auxiliary marking, citing the definition from the auxiliary marking club, which he is also a member. Uh, he believes that a cancellation or meter is not a marking used for special attention, circumstance, or situation but rather as a part of the usual order of postal business to note the date of mailing and or obliterate a stamp. What say you? Well, what say I is we can disagree and remain friends. It's okay. Um, but I would, I would say, um, I would say that that list comes directly from the auxiliary markings club website. So, um, so maybe they're not even clear on on whether that's the case or not. Um, I guess the, the bottom line is this. Um, when I collect, um, because I do I do a lot of pre-philatelic um, Belgian stampless covers, and on those covers, um, the postal markings, which you could call cancels because they definitely um, indicate that the thing has gone through the mail and they definitely indicate the the area of from which it was mailed, the city or town, um, that I think those do actually um, function as auxiliary markings because they're not really canceling a stamp. And I agree with, I understand what you're saying, um, but in those cases, they're markings on the envelope to show the, the distance that this has traveled um, to make sure that the postage it's collected is correct. Um, so yeah, like I say, we can disagree on this and and remain friends, and um, it's it's okay. But uh, you are not alone in your opinion. Wow, okay. I, that I I I would never have guessed that, but uh, here we are. I love that. Uh, <laughs> I do have one one last question for you before we move sure. on to the next section of this. Uh, and one of the viewers is asked: Is it necessary that these marks have to be used by the postal authorities to be classified as auxiliary markings? Uh, I think there are many markings used by private senders. And so I guess the question is, is what what uh, what source do they have to come from or do they have to come from a source to be an auxiliary marking? Sure. So, again, I mean, I hate to keep quoting the pre-philatelic things, but there are a lot of letters. You'll see a, a, a bunch in a little bit um, where uh, the uh, the fact that the letter was prepaid was written on by the person who was posting the letter. It'll say, you know, Port Pay or Franco or something like that. Um, and then it's stamped by the post office as um, confirmation of the fact that this has happened with a hand stamp or uh, something of, of that of that nature, usually hand stamp early on. So I would say um, that, yes, um, private manuscript script markings and even private hand stamps in some circumstances can also be seen as auxiliary marks. Okay. Got another one? Or are we ready to go? No, sir. I think we can go ahead and move ahead. I've got some other questions for you when we get towards the end of the, okay. the presentation. 
Okay, great. Okay, so telling a story through auxiliary markings. Um, here's a here's a question. Um, I don't. I would doubt that there's anybody here that collects this um, the prephilatelic European mail. Probably. I mean, you if you do, that's great. I'd love to talk more with you about it. And we look at this mail and we go, well, it doesn't really have much of interest other than who wrote it and what was its you know, trajectory from one city to another or one town to another. And I would say that there is a lot more to these letters than it first seems to be the case. If you look at the top of this one, it's got three little red crayon or chalk marks on it. And okay, that means that whatever the, whether it was a patar or a soul or a stiver, um, that the person that was receiving this was going to have to pay three. And that's true. We can tell that it's a postage due cover because it's on the front. If it was on the back, we would know that it had been paid. Um, but what else do the little marks tell us? Um, I'm going to assume that no one knows. And if you do, you know, by all means, take credit for it and put it in the chat. Um, there's some things we can tell about this. Number one, we all know about the Turnin Taxis family and uh, their royal mail and, um, and all of that. This was not sent by the Turnin Taxis post. This was sent by a communal post carrier. Um, it could have been any number of people. How do we know that? Well, we know that the Turnin Taxis post received their mail at an office, and we're going to see why that's important to begin with. But we know they didn't use crayons. This was taken in the field by someone who knew to make three marks on it because he had been trained to do that because he knew where it was heading, and he carried a crayon in his pocket. There's no desk involved in this. There's no ink. There's no anything. So even though there's no postmark on this at all, that tells us um, in 99,000 out of 10,000 examples that this was carried not by turn and taxes, but by communal post. Okay, so take a look at this one. See the little words on the left-hand corner? It's one of my favorite manuscript markings. Cheeto, cheeto, cheeto. This means quick, quick, quick. And if you take a look at this, this is an early express marking um, from somewhere around the late 1600s. If you take a look at this, you don't see any markings in terms of uh, numbers or crayon marks or anything. Um, the person has written this on the left-hand side and is trusting that they've paid the person who's going to carry the piece of mail a little bit extra in the hopes that they will get there, get this to where it's going as quickly as possible. And the lack of any numbers on the front tell us that this is prepaid. Don't be deceived by that um, red mark on the bottom there. Um, that's actually something that goes around the back and isn't a, isn't a marking that way. Okay, what's the little squiggle on this one? Well, this is a Turnin Taxis postage mark. Um, this tells the person who is receiving this that two souls is the cost of the postage. Um, how do we know it's Turnin Taxis? Because Turnin Taxis received their mail at a desk, they had ink, they had pens. The people that received the mail could read and were trained to properly inscribe the cover. So even though this just looks like a simple thing, this marking is actually telling us quite a bit. Okay, what does the lack of any auxiliary marking at all tell us? And I will defy you to read this. Um, one of the things that's hardest about doing all of this is learning to read the old script, and I'm not great at it, but I can tell you there are no markings on the cover of this. Well, what can we tell from this? This is a Royal Mail piece that was sent through Turnin, Texas. The preceding one was a 
uh, was a private piece of mail that someone paid to have carried. This is royal mail. This will be settled between the respective offices of turn and taxes. And uh, there will, there's no marking on the front because it is carried as an internal situation between two royal uh, addresses, if you will. Okay, take a look at this. This went from Ghent in Belgium to Amsterdam and it's a blockade letter. How can we tell this? Well, if you take a look at the bottom in this case, there's the cost of sending, sending a letter from Ghent, which is very near the, the border to Amsterdam. I think it's two patars. Unfortunately, they couldn't send it that way, so they had to send it by ship. And the marking in the upper corner, which was written by somebody who actually is, was capable of writing proper Arabic number, numbers, um, indicates that it's a ship marking. And so we know that this was sent around the blockade to Amsterdam because of those two different markings. Again, you know, it's very simple, um, but it's remarkable what you can read. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Is it paid? Well, you see the numbers on the front. How can you tell that this has not been paid? Well, as we said earlier, if the markings appear on the front, then the postage is due by the recipient. Okay, where and when? When was this sent? Where is it going? Well, it was sent from Ghent to Seville in Spain. And if you take a look at, there are two markings here. Now, there's a marking from bottom left to top right that looks like that slash that we were talking about before. So why is there an additional pen marking that indicates that there's additional postage due? Well, it's because prior to the UPU, you couldn't pay a private letter from one country to another because there was no way to justify the, um, the transference of the amount of money that was involved. You can only pay it to the border. So when this gets to the border of Belgium and it's going to Seville, from that point on, it's charged postage. And you can see at the top, it says Ghent Franco, that's showing that it was paid, the postage was paid to the border. Um, if you ever are interested in um, the markings, um, you can usually tell which period of Belgian and Northern European history um, these um, markings in the upper right-hand corner come from because the Netherlands post office preferred the term Franco um, and the French post office had, had preferred the term Port Pays. Okay, why are there no markings on this one? Well, this is very similar to the other one. This is a, a, a monastery letter that is going from one monastery to another. And it's carried by a monk um, who will go and he will spend the night at the other monastery or maybe take two or three days to walk there. And so it's a private letter with no markings on it. Okay, so enough of the early stuff. Let's take a look at these. Um, these are the many, many ways that a European letter can be marked as paid. And this really only scratches the surface of it. Um, you'll see Franco, you'll see Port Pays, Port Betold is a, is a Dutch indication that payment has been made. Uh, en numeraire is the French uh, indication that postage has been paid. This is an interesting one on the bottom left, Franco Hamburg. Um, this is going from the Netherlands to Germany. And the Netherlands and Germany had a postal agreement. So unlike the preceding letter, which we saw that went from Ghent, um, you could pay the postage all the way to Germany. And so this is indicating that the postage has been paid all the way from the Netherlands to Hamburg. 
Okay, we get it. It's paid. Big deal. So now we get into the to the topic that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, how can you say that um, cancellations and postmarks are uh, are actually um, auxiliary markings? Well, if I take a look at this, I can tell where it came from. I can tell uh, when it was mailed. That's important. Um, but there's no indication in that marking in that uh, in that uh, cancel um, whether the thing has actually been paid or not. Um, and so here's an example of a private manuscript mark. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, it says Franco. The person that sent this letter has written, "I want this to go, and I have paid for it." Um, the post office doesn't care whether you think you've paid for it. They're going to stamp it themselves to indicate to the other post office that this has actually been paid. And then, of course, the slash from upper left to bottom right also tells us it's been paid. Okay, what can we learn from auxiliary markings? Um, in this case, I, I find this fascinating. Here's an example of what I think really is an auxiliary marking. Um, take a look at the upper left hand corner, the right hand corner of the left hand, and the left hand corner of the right hand. These are both uh, markings from the time of the French occupation of the area, the, the Napoleon French uh, army occupation of Belgium. And all they did simply was continue their postal office um, um, designations. And so you get the designations for the occupied territories. But what's the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right? If you take a look, you'll notice that the one on the right has PP next to it. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of that, you'll see it says Port Payee. So even the indications that were placed on the letters um, that indicated where it was from were also designed to tell you whether it had been paid or not. Um, notice the big X in the middle of that. Well, that tells you, of course, that this is, um, there's no postage due on this letter at all. Whereas on the left-hand side, um, there's the squiggly five in the middle to tell you that this is going to cost, um, I think, five souls at this point. Might be five, yeah, five souls. Okay, so telling a story, um, what can we learn from these markings? Well, we've already seen we can learn who carried the marking, uh, who carried the mail. Was the postage due? Was it prepaid? Uh, we can also tell by the designation of the words, um, in this case, Franco, Port Pei, who the ruling class was, who the ruling country was at the time. Let's take a look at another one. So here we've got the marking in the upper right-hand corner that we just saw in the preceding one. Um, look at the bottom right-hand corner. This is a real and true auxiliary mark. This is designed to say to um, the, the people in Paris, as it's going to Paris, that this has been paid to its destination in this day. And of course, we see the manuscript mark with the axes on it. Okay, so take a look at these uh, at both sides of this letter and see if you can figure out um, why it's marked the way it is. So you've got uh, a hand stamp telling you that it was sent from Antwerp. You've got a marking on the top right hand side in red that says uh, that it was received after the mail had departed. So therefore, we can't, um, um, we couldn't send it out the day we got it, and that's why it's a day late. We've also got a blue marking in the middle that tells you that this post office was in the fourth rayon. Rayons are the way that they, they think of it like districts. It was four districts from the French border. So the postage was paid to the French border, and you'll see a departure mark in the bottom right-hand side uh, that tells you this went through this particular post office, which was a transfer station. But look at the bottom, which is the back of this. Um, it says that there's postage due in the left-hand corner. 
Why is there postage due? Well, because this is going to Paris and you can't pay the postage all the way to Paris at this particular time. So while the postage was paid from Antwerp all the way to the transfer station, it's there's still postage due when it gets there. And that's what the um, auxiliary markings tell us. Okay, here's a really interesting group of um, auxiliary markings. Um, the top one is a kind of variation on which area of the country this came from. Um, it's also going to Paris. Um, so the top one tells us now that this particular route is taking us through um, a different area that's allowing us to only be charged at the second rayon, not the fourth. Um, why is that? Well, if you take a look on the left-hand side, there's an auxiliary marking that says par estafette, um, which means that it went by express mail, most likely in a fast carriage or on a horse. So this is an early, early in, um, incarnation of, what should we say, like Federal Express or, um, you know, Canada Post Express Mail or, you know, whatever we call it. Um, on the bottom left-hand side, it tells us how this got into Paris. Um, it went from Belgium via, via the um, uh, post office uh, in Valenciennes, which was um, the transit office. And then you'll see on the front, there are two slashes. And those two slashes are telling you, once it was received in Valenciennes, here's what the postage is on the other side as it's going to Paris. There's a couple more. Um, take a look at this one. Um, this is an internal mail uh, marking. You'll notice that this one is blue and nobody really knows why this is the case, um, but Brussels always uses blue ink. It's the only city in Belgium that is allowed to cancel in blue ink. And I've never been able to really find out why, but anyway, that's why it's blue. Um, you can see there's an auxiliary marking to tell you that this came from Bureau B. Um, and Bureau B was the Brussels office, and there's a port payee marking at the top left, PP. Um, why is there no postage due on this? Well, because Doulan is a city in Brussels, and, or a city in Belgium, and so it's an internal piece of mail. So it could be paid in its entirety. Um, and so by knowing this, we're able to tell that there was no postage due on this. And the port payee mark helps us to understand that it was prepaid. It came from the Brussels office and went to Tuan, and this is why there's no postage on it. Okay, look at the top of this. There, There is something missing in that auxiliary marking at the top. Now, I just told you that the Brussels office only uses blue ink, and now I'm showing you this. Um, I can't explain why this one is uh, is red or brown. I don't know, so you might want to ask that, but I cannot answer it. I apologize. What's missing? Well, if you look at the top, the number in between those two P's is missing. The department number under the French is missing. How can we tell what this means? Well, if you look at the date on the bottom, 1830 is the time that Belgium became an independent nation. The Belgians were very, very angry at the French. And so they ground the numbers for the departments off those port payee markings on the top and left just the port payee as they were waiting for their own government to create new um, uh, new markings for them. So anytime you see that marking with nothing in the middle, it's a bunch of angry Belgian post uh, postal employees who want to erase the French from their situation. Okay, um, look at this one. This one's going um, from Holland to um, Italy. And take a look. We saw this earlier. We saw FCO, Franco Frankfurt, um, that told us that there was a, a reciprocal agreement, postal agreement, that was, existed between Italy, or sorry, between Holland and Germany. 
Um, so it could cross the border and be paid that far. But now take a look. This has evolved into a hand stamp that also says it's going via Frankfurt. It's been paid to Frankfurt. But because there's no reciprocal um, uh, agreement between Holland and Italy, it can only be half paid. And if you look at the center of this, kind of slightly off center, halfway down, you'll see that it's half paid because once it gets to Frankfurt, there's no agreement. And now we have to, uh, we have to pay uh, or the recipient has to pay. And so that gives us a lot of really interesting information. Something new, look at the top. In between the stamps and the cancel, there's a new marking. And this is the PD marking, this auxiliary marking, PP markings and PD markings are fascinating to me. This now shows post um, general postal union that you actually can pay to the destination. And this mark tells us that this particular piece of mail has been paid to Paris and that no postage is due. So when you see PD, of course, this tells us that it's paid to the destination, Port Destinaire. Okay, just a couple of really quick things on typology. Um, one of the things that's hardest about collecting um, these markings is um, how to organize them. Um, many people collect by type, so they keep all of their return mail together, they keep their, you know, um, delayed mail postage due together. Um, I find that a little bit difficult because I can't really draw any conclusions from type of auxiliary marking to the other. Um, so many of us collect by date. Um, and in my case, that's actually very interesting because uh, uh, there are a lot of correspondence between European auxiliary markings and labels um, that are similar across a large number of labels. That works very well for me. So you, from earliest to latest. Um, some people collect by difference. In other words, is it a label? Is it a hand stamp? Is it a manuscript marking? And then how do each one of those change? Um, some have a frame around them. Some are unframed. Um, some are in a circle. Some have a double circle. Um, and then that allows you to create a typology, which is slightly different um, for, each, for each marking. Some collect by region. And um, a, a lot of people collect in a way that allows them to illustrate their, to, to make the point about their individual auxiliary markings that um, they want to. So they develop their own typology, which might not be particularly illustrative to anyone else, um, but accomplishes their goal. Okay, some remarkable books. Um, both of these next two books are available through the APS bookstore. I recommend them very highly. Um, this book, New York City Auxiliary Markings, 1798 to 2022, um, is um, written by two gentlemen who are the gods of American um, auxiliary markings, Tony Warakevich and Tom Bresky, both of whom are members of the Auxiliary Markings Group. Um, this is a remarkable book to help you get your head around American, the type of things that existed. Um, it's beautifully laid out by individual type of marking and I recommend it very highly. Um, this book goes slightly deeper. I would say it's about 500 uh, pages. It's a life's work um, and uh, it, it has everything that you could ever want to know about post markings and auxiliary markings in the city of Chicago. But again, if you're really into this, it will help you to see um, things like how to organize, um, how to see difference where you might not at first recognize it. Uh, and this is available from the APS. Um, there are two remarkable courses currently on um, C3A. Um, I think that's right. C3A is the, um, is the term for um, online learning. Um, number one is a three session on-demand course by um, 
Gary Lowe, understanding auxiliary markings and their importance. Um, these deal almost entirely with American markings. Um, and Gary goes into tremendous detail about different typologies. So if that's interesting, you might want to do that. And then, of course, John Hotchner, who's uh, among many other things, has made a career out of studying auxiliary markings. Um, this is also on C3A, solving auxiliary marking puzzles, and it goes into much more detail than we did today um, to kind of get your thinking that way. Okay, so just the beginning, collect what interests you, collect what enriches your collecting journey, study to improve your enjoyment, and your exhibiting scores, the more you can tell people about what's on the cover that you're exhibiting, the better your research and knowledge will be seen. Um, and remember, there's no right or wrong way to collect auxiliary markings. Um, we've already disagreed tonight on this a couple of times, um, and I'm quite sure that, you know, we'll be friends when we see each other at the Great American Stamp Show. Last of all, if you're really interested in this, please have a look at postalmarkings.org, which is the Auxiliary Markings Club. I believe only the last two years of the newsletter are under um, a paywall. Uh, the 20 years before that are available, and um, it's a real veritable um, treasure trove of uh, of information and at $15 for the year, which is what I think the current cost is, it certainly is worth it. So that's it for me. Thank you. Eric, thank you very much for that. You've given a lot of resources tonight. I'll make sure that when we post this online on YouTube that we'll reference those in the description page so that for those watching, they'll have a place to go back and refer to them. But you've given a lot of good information tonight. I, I, I've got a couple of questions for you, so let me get to those. First question is, can you define a communal post and where it was used, i.e. which countries? Okay, um, so uh, communal post is a term that's used for Belgian mail specifically. I don't know if it exists in other countries or not. The turn in taxes people wanted the complete and total control of all mail. Um, and so communal post was designed to send mail from one city to one that was close and nearby. Um, and in addition to this, there was a royal post. Um, and the royal post and the turn in taxes post disagreed very heartily on the use of communal post. And so there were street fights and riots, and it was really quite something. And eventually the king relented and said, as long, or the, the, the ruler relented, wasn't a king in those days, and said, as long as the, um, as long as it doesn't interfere with royal mail or paid international mail, you can carry the mail back and forth, but you cannot carry anything uh, that involves, in other words, you can't undercut the uh the royal post or the turn of taxes post i have another question here referencing the aps summer seminar for those of you who are there and viewing tonight thank you very much for coming it was great to see everyone there at the shaping the mail seminar last week ap uh, at the aps summer seminar robert dalton harris identified address labels also an auxiliary marking as a new class of collectible ephemera what uh, do you have any response to that? It's more of a I, comment I than a question. That, yeah, no, I think I think that goes very much with what we were saying. I I don't know that it's a new I don't know that it's a new area. Um, it might just be a continuation of the things that we were that we indicated earlier. But yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, the the thing is, we all know we all collect very interesting, very niche things. Um, Cheryl Gans, I heard her once say that she likes to collect things, um, A, that there's room to study and write about, and she likes to collect things that are interesting that most other people don't seem to be paying a lot of attention to. Don't That's not a direct quote, but it's the same thing. Like, that's why I love auxiliary markings. Nobody writes about Belgian auxiliary markings at all. Um, and so it doesn't take long before you get recognized as the world you know, renowned expert on this, which is saying absolutely nothing. Um, but it's a little niche market that, you know, I find interesting. Interestingly enough, uh, and next question is frequently, I saw the mark charge on the cover from the European countries. 
what kinds of mail are they uh, suggesting perhaps registered or some other type? Yeah, it depends on the it depends on the period. Um, originally, um, it's actually it's charge A, which means I'm putting essentially to paraphrase, I'm putting you in charge of this letter. I'm trusting you to get it there. Um, and it meant that you carried it to someone and you might not even have paid them. You just entrusted them to do it. Um, later on in European mail, you'll very often run into charge and recommande as interchangeable for registered mail. Um, and uh, so it depends on what period you're looking at. Sometimes uh, the charge a mark can mean that there's something very valuable in the envelope and it has to be delivered directly to the person to whom it's going. You can't just leave it at a at a home or whatever. Um, but that comes a little bit later, maybe in the in the late 18th century and early 19th century. Well, I think we've covered all the bases for tonight, and uh, I realize now that there's a lot more we could dive into of auxiliary markings than uh, where we we left off tonight. So uh, I have some more questions for you. I'll ask when we see each other in Cleveland at the Great American Stamp Show. And for those of you who are attending, I know Greg will be there, and I'll certainly be there. So hopefully we'll catch up then. Um, Greg, anything you want to add before we call it, call it a night with this? Um, no, I just, I think that, um, since we're all interested largely, and you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in improving your knowledge base, this is one area where we all can really learn a great deal that's beyond just the stamp and the cancel and the root and that kind of thing. Um, and so I encourage you, find find out what interests you and dig into it. Um, the, the APRL uh, digital is an unbelievable source for information on this, and uh, as it are the research librarians in the APA RL, um, they've found some remarkable things for me, and I'm very grateful. So it will it will really enrich in your journey. And please always get in touch. I'm I'm sure that through Scott you can get my email, and please always get in touch if there's anything I can help with. Okay, well this has been. Absolutely fascinating. I can't thank you enough for doing this, Greg. Uh, for those watching, if you did not see the full presentation or you'd like to watch it again, the session has been recorded and will be available on the APS YouTube page. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the APS YouTube page for all of our future stamp chats. If you're not a member of the APS, as I always say, why not? We'd love to have you as part of our stamp community. For more information, visit us at stamps.org. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.